Hey, I'm Hrani Glaubmann. <coughs> uh, I'm a retired professor from the Department of Psychology in Bar Ilan University in Israel. And my wife and colleague is Rivka Glaubmann from the School of Education in Bar Ilan University. We collaborate for many years in research in the field of children's uh, social dramatic uh, make-belief games which led us to the subject of imagination, which is the thing that brings together our field and uh, dynamics. Uh, and we want to share with you some of our ideas in this field. And uh, in a way, as you said, we are to a very large extent come from the other side. And we are trying to do the impossible of following your suggestion of a solution of how to be a second. Uh, so I'd like to start with a confession. Until recently, we were not familiar with the field of harmonics at all. My partner, Rivka, and, uh, which is, in, as I said, in the School of Education, and I, from the experimental psychologists. And we did a lot of work on imagination, yet we failed to see the connection. I must admit it is a strange because now when the connection was made, it seems so obvious, but we didn't see it. It is only when we met with the art works of Seraphine de saint -Lys that helped the penny drop. Can we switch off the slides? No. Because I think so. It's a little out of focus. But if, it's if you take that, those lights as well, that would oh, no, no, that lovely. Like that's on the screen should be off the rest. Yes. yes, this one. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's not, it's it's this not, it's not directly, directly pointing at the screen. The ones that are pointing at the screen. Yes, they want to be more switches. It's a job. No, it's not critical. It's not so. Okay, Seraphine painted only what and how she was instructed. Oh, no, that's them. Can't you do anything about this slide? Maybe in this one? That's funny. Is there anything on the console there? There might be some switches down here. Oh. I've noticed that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Great. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Seraphine painted only what and how she was instructed by a divine voice. Even the size of her canvases was decided by this divine voice. We enjoy these wonderful pieces of art because Seraphine listened to the divine voice and followed this call. She painted only in accordance to the voice's guidance. Now, it does not matter whether we believe that what she heard was the result of sound waves reaching her ear, namely that she heard a real voice, as you call the naive, the first naiveness, or we think that what she heard was just an inner voice. For us, the voice, whether it comes from a divine source or is an inner voice, is real. It exists in her mind, it functions as an initiator and guide for action, and the most impressive evidence of its exi existence is the magnificent, magnificent works of art we have just seen. As I said, there the penny drop. I realized that this voice is one of many faces of what we call imagination. So I might be using a different language and my concepts and terminology might be a bit different since the notional context of my concept 
his imagination is somewhat different from the spiritual approach. But basically, we are talking about the same phenomenon, imagination. Imagination can be described as in listening to an inner voice which is characterized by being spontaneous, non-rational, non-linear, subconscious, <coughs> fictional, and the opposite of epistemic realistic thinking. <coughs> now, the main claim that we wish to propose in the present work is that fictional mental activity and imagination are primary mental processes, with underscore primary, and that there are obvious evolutionary reasons why they exist as devices for the effective adaptation. If I would paraphrase Leslie, who holds an op opposite opinion, as we shall see in the slide after the next, <coughs> I would say that fictional, that fictional uh, mental activity and imagination are primary mental processes and there are obvious evolutionary reasons why they exist as devices for efficient adaptation. That is a par paraphrase of the next one that is a quotation of Leslie who, who is on, on, uh, thinks the opposite. Evolutionary we are, uh, acquire an ability to fictional representation and the more imaginative it is, the more efficient it is. There are obvious evolutionary reasons why cognition requires a system that, uh, that uh, represents the world in a fictional and imaginative manner. In the first part of my presentation, I will present the theoretical arguments and for our claim, and in the second part, I will refer briefly to some empirical findings that support the claim. Examining education and developmental psychology literature, especially the literature on theory of mind, it is quite clear that the commonly held opinion is that epistemic mental functions is primary, and the fictional imaginative mental activity is secondary, and begins to develop as a malfunction of the former. Leslie can serve as an ex example of this view. So that what he says on <coughs> epistemic, evolutionary, it's almost the same wording. I only put imagination instead of perceptual and thought requires a system word, a serious and literal way. I shall call this basic kind of possession primary uh, representation. And we believe that imagination, imaginative uh, representation, fictional representation are not less primary than this. And that's what we will try to uh, bring forward here. The words of Leslie represent the common view held by most scientists in developmental psychology and education, including leading figures such as Piaget and others. As you can see, I pour the exact point of Leslie to express an opposite view by referring them to the fictional imaginative faculty of the mind. A careful theoretical and empirical examination of this current position raises serious doubts as to its validity. Theoretically, its basic premise is doubtful. There is no reason to believe that the child is born with a concept of a real world. Building a realization that there is a real objective world out there and that the perceptions that one experiences are connected to it and are a representation of it is a product of a long process of perceptual learning. And it's not primary. It is more reasonable to assume that the fictional mental experiences come before the epistemic, or at least at the same time. A person, at the beginning of his life, is exposed to external stimuli. These stimuli are received by the senses, and, the experience, and he experiences them as perceptual experiences. 
He has no direct contact with, the rea with reality, and he lives in a world of mental representation of this reality. He has no way to recognize of recognizing the existence of this external objective world, neither can he identify it as the source of his experiences. For him, the inner world is fictional representation and precedes the epistemic present, uh, representation. It takes a long process of perceptual learning to get us to conceive the existence of a real objective world. <coughs> Okay. This view is also in accord with Freud's conceptual framework. According to Freud, the its primary thinking processes are the earliest and the core of the mental activity, while the ego's secondary thinking and reality testing develop later through interaction with the world. Thus, we offer an alternative approach to the commonly accepted one. We claim that the faculty of fictional representation and imagination is a primary, as, as a primary as the epistemic, and that there are obvious evolutionary reasons for this existence. They both develop in parallel, interacting with each other and enhancing each other. When we examine the issue from an evolutionary viewpoint, it is quite clear that the epistemic thinking, reality testing, and differentiation between the real and the fictional are not only needed for adaptation, they are critical for survival. Without these abilities, we will perish. They are vital in each aspect of existence, such as providing ourselves with food and shelter, avoiding danger, finding our way around, etc. But we claim that fictional representation and imagination are not less essential for adaptation. First of all, most of the situations in life are complicated and their com componte components are not all available to perception and epistemic representation. And we have to fill the ga these gaps of information by fictional representations. The role of fictional representation and imagination is even more obvious in planning and in decision making that involves weighing alternatives and examining hypotheses. 